Folks, welcome to Ameriknek, New York, and uh, joined today by a legendary uh, doctor and uh, master master musician, Dr. Mganga, Eddie Henderson. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I thought you had to be 100 years old to be a legend. Well, I mean, think times are changing. We're, we're living in very different times now. But I guess so. I just want to be clear. You just said something to my, my, my friend here. Uh, you were the first black... Olympic figure skater? Is that not, not Olympic? I, uh, the first black person. Yes, I, I fell in love with figure skating when I was fourteen. When I first moved to San Francisco uh, with my mother when she remarried, and I saw the Ice Fathers, I fell in love with it, and I practiced diligently. But it, it, this is you have to realize this is like 1954, 55, pre-black power. That's a very racist sport at that time, and they wouldn't let me compete. I mean, would they let me join the club? You know, how would they? I mean, if you were going for a try, I remember Richard Davis talking about mm -hmm. like classical um, mm -hmm. tryouts. He just wouldn't get a call back. I was know. it was it was it over? They just say get out of here. What would they? How would no, they? Well, I, 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 I would skate at the sessions and stuff, but I wanted to join the club where all the competitors were. They just outright told me, "Well, we're not going to give you an application." So, in order to compete in figure skating championships. You have to join the United States Figure Skating Association, but so you can compete as the individual member. Wow! So that's what I had to do. The San Francisco Club would let me in, and then after I joined the Air Force, I'd, uh, I was in station in Denver, Colorado. Then the Denver Club, where they trained the Olympics, uh, like Colorado Springs, with open arms, they wanted me to represent them. So that was my second time competing at the Midwestern Championships, and I won the free skating part of the competition there. Wow. I mean, I mean, you know, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about uh, Howard University um, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Benny Golson uh, was first there. There, mm -hmm. there was no, no... No jazz department. Can you can you tell the audience, talk to the... Because, I mean, every, you're, you're teaching at a jazz department mm -hmm. now at Oberlin. There's mm -hmm. jazz departments all over the... The world now. Exactly. Um, at that time, I want you to talk about the the cat that was there. That when you guys were playing, you're like, "This is black people's music, man." And he's like, "No, this know. Is, you know." Can know. you talk, talk about when you got there? Well, see, well, Benny Golson was there before I got there. I was in medical school, but he was in the in the music school. He's a little older than I am. That uh, there was no jazz department as such then, and that famous tune that he's famous for, "Killer Joe," he wrote it for his first harmony class, the teacher gave him an F and said, it's against the law to have this chord after that chord, and that's his iconic hit. And so, anyway, when I got there, after he flunked out, <laughs> so to speak, um, I'm in medical school, there still was no jazz department, it was all classical, so to speak, quote unquote. And uh, so I was with all my friends practicing in the practice rooms after I, after medical school during the day because I really wanted to just play music, to tell you the truth. And so all of a sudden this elderly black gentleman comes in and Rome says, uh, excuse me, uh, that's not, doesn't sound like Beethoven or Bach to me. So I said, well, no. I didn't know he was the dean of the, of the school, <laughs> you know. So I said, well, no, that's jazz. So quote, unquote, he says to me, that is vulgar N-word music and it will not be allowed to be played uh, within the walls of Howard University, the number one black school in the country. And so I gave him a little edification on the importance of jazz. What do you say to him? What did you say to him? Do you what remember? What I say to him? I said, I, I ought to be ashamed of yourself here, a black man, and ja jazz contribution to this society from black people. So he says, well, uh, I don't recognize you in the music department. I said, no, I'm in medical school. So he said to me, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't go down to see, try to see a patient in the hospital. So I looked at him dead. I, I still didn't know who he was. And even if I did know, I would have said the same thing. I, I said, well, that's because you're not qualified. So he threw me out and hired an armed guard to patrol the, the music department room to make sure jazz was not being played. So I snuck back in about a month and a half later quietly practicing in the practice room and he hired this big, big, huge, you know, a, a black gentleman, Mr. Coleman, I never forget his name. So he's listening to me outside, 
broke in the room, cocked his gun and put it to my head and said, get out of here. That's swinging too hard for my taste and threw me out. Okay. So th this, this is an all black university rejecting you, the music of, of jazz. Of jazz. Yes. Of, uh, yeah. and, and so unfortunately, uh, Dean lost, that was his name. He had a heart attack and died. And Donald Byrd, the trumpet player, became the dean after that and instituted the jazz department at, at, at Howard. Donald and I always laugh about that story. You know, I just, I, I've been talking to Warren Smith yesterday and oh, yeah. Kenny Barron this morning, and, and uh -huh. I wanted to ask you, I mean, Youssef didn't like the term jazz because he looked uh -huh. it up and it was, uh, I forget what Kenny said, the definition in Webster said, but... It was uh, loud and, and dissident kind yes. of music. And then Warren was just talking about the, 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 the naval bases in New Orleans and how you'd go to these houses of ill repute. Uh, exactly. Okay. That's so, how it started. It, right. Now, we know how that's... And then, you know, Big Black would say that it, it was jazz. J -A Black, that's my friend. And, that's, <laughs> well, and we'll get into that, because that, 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 that group you played with, Hadley Callum and oh, him, yes, yes. That, was the first, that was the first group you were in. But right. um, do you think that... Even at that time, you were comfortable using the word jazz? Well, you know, when I fell in love with it after hearing Miles Davis and all that, you know, it was called jazz, so I just rolled up my tongue. But the way it was incepted, like in those houses of ill repute in New Orleans, uh, 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 with the, man, the, uh, the Caucasian man would be upstairs with the prostitute. Right, guy downstairs and playing boogie woogie. would be a black honky-tonk piano playing, playing downstairs. It's, Play that jive ass music, and it was it was shortened to jazz. So that's how the name was incepted or conceived. Sure, but like Max Roach would go to blows over that name. You know, I mean, I know. people hated that, I but know. you never got hung up on that. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, just the connotation of it nowadays is that's like it's a dirty word. Uh, uh, just like uh, you know, among, among the black community, you know, black people say to each other each other hey n word you know with with affection absolutely but, but now that's a no no <laughs> you can't use the n word well it depends on how you pronounce it <laughs> or enunciate it you know uh but and it's just a word you know uh well, the reason i bring it up is no, because no, today no. it's like when you're teaching you could ask 15 different people mm -hmm. what that definition of the word you got what 15 different answers uh, absolutely. What did it mean to you when you heard Miles when, swing, like when you heard him playing? The word jazz, uh, uh, well, see, my first trumpet teacher in person when I was nine years old was Louis Armstrong. Oh, I love it. Uh, keep playing Love Satchmo. Yeah, and and because my mother knew him, and so my mother said, let's go hear Satchmo. I don't know, I heard it was jazz, you know, so... I guess that's what it is. That's what my mother told me, you know. Can you talk about when Louis saw you play and, and well, the yeah, confidence he gave you? I think that's one of the time, sweetest stories of all time. The first time my mother took me, I was nine years old. My feet couldn't even touch the ground. My mother was on this side. Sarah Vaughn was on this side. They took me to see Satchmo, you know, because they know him. Just my mother, by virtue of my mother being in the Cotton Club. And all I remember, he was warming up. We were sitting in the box seats over here. You could see him behind the curtain warming up while the big band was playing. And I remember just saying to myself, damn, he sure got a big sound, you know. <laughs> My mother took me backstage, and on his trumpet, he taught me, it was the first I was nine years old, taught me, I had no idea who he was or what stature he held. He taught me how to make a sound on his mouthpiece and trumpet. So, I st uh, you know, I was in the music. I really wanted to play the, uh, the clarinet. Because my best friend Larry Katz in the fifth grade in the musical aptitude class, uh, but he played clarinet, but they ran out of clarinets, and all they had left was the accordion and violin. So I said, no, no, no. So luckily, my Uncle Louie, my mother's brother, he had um, a trumpet. So after Satchmo showed me how to make a sound, Uncle Louie gave me his horn, and I studied very diligently. Every day, took private lessons, and one year later, I went back. My mother took me to see Satchmo with DiPaolo again. He says, hey, little lady, you still playing? And I said, yeah, man, give me a horn. So, <laughs> and played Flight of the Bumblebee for him, you know. And I remember I could see him screaming and fell off the chair. You know, it made a shriek. And when he was getting up, he said, hey, little lady, that's some of the baddest shit I ever heard in my life. And, and told his wife to get him a book of ten of his solos transcribed. 
and I still have it somewhere in, in some vault around here. And it says, to little Eddie, this is to warm your chops up by me, your lips. Uh, uh, it sound wonderful. Keep playing, love, Satchmo. And I remember looking at my mother, and I said, who's this cat, you know? I was just 10 years old, I had no idea. You know, but in retrospect, whenever I think back, I said, oh my God. I didn't know it was gonna turn into the rest of my life. One of the things that we've talked about, we've done a couple of radio interviews, uh, is your stepfather uh, the, being a doctor. He was not, he was a doctor for Miles Davis. He was a doctor for Miles Davis, for, for Billy Holiday, for Duke Ellington, Count Basie, John Coltrane, Cannonball Latterly, all the notables, Sarah Vaughn, uh, 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 Nat King Cole, everybody. He loved jazz, but he had no talent. He had no talent, so he was insecure. But he, he was bummed that he didn't have any yeah, talent for yeah. that. But then so, he, but he didn't. Even though you you had an abra a very abrasive, that might be the wrong word. I don't know. Yeah, but it's, it's a great word. It's a great word. Yeah. But but he wouldn't. He would take you to the Blackhawk. Oh yeah. You you were at those Saturday the Saturday night at the Blackhawk session every night because Miles was staying at our house that whole two weeks. He was staying. Miles was staying. And, with he, and Miles would took me sometimes. So the other nights, my father, my stepfather would take me. I got a chance to see. Everybody there, Max Roach uh, uh, with Clifford Brown. No, no, not not with Book Little. Uh, you see Cannonball, Miles Coltrane, everybody. So through him, even though we didn't get along, he was the one that really exposed me to quote unquote jazz. What is like with someone like Miles? When even at an impressionable age, mm -hmm. what did you learn about nonverbal communication on the bandstand? Well, that, that's what impressed me most about him. His aura, walking on the bandstand. As soon as he'd walk on, he'd he'd command immediate attention and respect for the other guy. He didn't have to say, "Okay, okay, okay I, one, two, one." Just he'd walk on the bandstand. Everyone would say, "Attention, there he is," you know. And just the way he moved, it was almost like uncanny. You know, that like a panther walking through the jungle. You know, like he's walking on, on air almost. And then just the way, just little innuendos. I learned so much for him. There's one little funny story that, that you were like on this interview. <laughs> I remember my, my, my parents kept saying, when I was sitting in the living room, and I came home from my, from my lesson. You know, I said, well, Eddie, we're giving you all these lessons. Uh, uh, you know, Miles, give him a lesson. <laughs> and Miles looked so unique. He was like, he was blacker than this, but had these keen features. So I'm looking at him like, like that. So he, he got a napkin. I could read music very well. So he got a napkin. And he drew five lines like as a music staff, you know. And then and they said, in his voice like that, you know, he said, this is a low C. I mean, I knew that. I'm still, I'm still looking at him. <laughs> He's writing the music, and I'm looking at him like this. And he said, this is an E. I'm saying, this is a G, and this is a B flat. And on the top, he said, that's a C7 chord. And I'm still looking at him. He said, man, look at the music. Don't look me at me. <laughs> I'll never forget that. What what was your when you <coughs> did you get to cross paths with Miles once you became uh, mm -hmm. a, once you became a professional musician and, uh -huh. and gigging did did you cross paths with him? Oh, did absolutely. Uh, after I joined Herbie Hancock, oh oh, I remember. Let me backtrack a yeah. little bit. Miles, you know, he was so dark, and but he had a complex about it. Remember, for, let me backtrack a little more. Remember, I tell you, I used to ice skate and stuff. And sure. Ice skate. He came to one of my competitions. He did. Yeah. And so that night at the Black Hawk, you know, he, uh, he'd always, you know, mess with me. And so in front of the other musicians, he said, Eddie, where's your skating skirt? You didn't wear it here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to slap me all the time, you know. And, you know, I'm short, but Miles Davis, he was about this big, you know. <laughs> He's like a little dwarf. You know, I said, oh. Then after I, I was in medical school, you know, I, I grew up, my voice got a little deeper, and then he slapped me, and I'm with my wife, so I grabbed him by the throat, I'm, I'm punching him on the ground. Miles, wait, Miles took you by the, th Miles no, choked? No, he slapped me. He slapped you. So I grabbed him by the throat and threw him to the ground, and I'm nailed, him, you know. <laughs> and so I'm there with my, my first wife, and so the club owner, opening night, he didn't know I knew Miles, so they pulled me off, 
And so I said, well, Miles, tell him you hit me first. <laughs> tell him you know me, man. <laughs> Miles said, I never saw this yellow, no trumpet playing motherfucker in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and they threw me out. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Berkeley late sixties. I never saw this yellow no trumpet playing. Yellow no life. trumpet player in my <laughs> life. Yeah. That, that's that's the thing I want you to. You're, you're at Oberlin now with Bart's Billy Hart. It's a, it's a great faculty, but you know as well as anybody the, the institutions, the Blakeys, the Dizzies, mm -hmm. the guys that used the apprenticeships mm -hmm. are gone. Yeah, is that something that you were able to? I don't want to say replicate, but how do you? Help those cats, yeah. because because you can you can play them all the Charlie Parker records and Miles Davis yeah, records you I want, agree. but what the institutions? How do you guys compensate for that? Yeah, well, well, see that, that that's a big sh uh, uh, hole, a big gap, a big shoe that's missing uh, to fill in. Yes, because like I played with Art Blakey for uh, a year and a, at least a year of my life, and that institution, I mean, he would always bring younger guys up. And you you spend a few years with him as an apprenticeship, and go out on your own as a journeyman. That's what Wayne Shorter did, Freddie Hubbard, Lee Morgan, Cedar Walton, all, Cedar Walton, all the greats. You know, went through that institution. There are uh, Horace Silver had an institution. Absolutely. Cannonball had his institution. Coltrane had his institution. You know, uh, there are no more institutions like that anymore. And I speak about this often. And, and by virtue of that, younger talented musicians have no avenue through which to hone their craft out. Because you just can't come from school and all of a sudden come out and say, okay, now I'm going to be a leader. No, you have to do your, your apprenticeship. And, there's, and unfortunately, there's no place to do that. You just can't listen to records in school and do transcription and come out and expect to have the credentials like those guys had in the past. And I don't know the answer to that. I was going to say, you don't, at this point, you're okay. You and you guys sit around. That is, but that's the bridge we, we have to, you know, in order yeah. to cross. I don't know how to. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer myself. But there, there is a bridge, a little synaptic gap that's not uh, uh, there. I mean, no, the gap is there. How to bridge it. It is the challenge nowadays? Is it just like like why did it? When did you first notice the touring circuit completely disappearing? I mean, that's part of it. it was like yeah. you you would stay for a month at, at the London. I mean, of course, that was the most transcendent thing. That I not yeah. sure who. I think it was Buster or or somebody was telling me that the um that that the 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 waitresses when with well, this is when M one D she wound up at the right. London house. Okay, That's maybe when you, they first started M one D she. They they just you know it's normally like Oscar Peterson Ray Brown kind of you know yeah really good swing straight ahead beat right. you know like the Pershing room and where I'm at uh, where I'm at uh, but then you guys are playing this music and the the manager's like you know let's start later yeah and then the, the waitress steakhouse <laughs> was, and then the wait the waitresses were going up to the patrons and saying can you please be quiet people yeah. were met in yeah. serious yeah. deep meditation so. Yeah. When did that start to dissipate? We're talking about the touring circuits, the months mm -hmm. at a time, the, the ability okay. to stay for a month at a time. Well, when, I, when we when I first joined the M1D group in like 1970, we used to uh, t t there was a circuit, the Northern Circuit, you to go from here to Chicago, uh, to Denver, to San Francisco or Seattle and L.A. Right. Southern Circuit, Kansas City, St. Louis, you know, and and and, and back the, the, the Chillin Circuit. Or more or less you used to call it. Now there's no more circuits, you know, the, because of the airfares, the clubs dried up, and so that therefore you have to nowadays you have to make these big jumps between here. L.A. is dried up. There's no jazz there, so you have to go to San Francisco or Seattle or Europe or Europe. Or, and, and, that, and that's the other part Chicago's I wanted to ask. Chicago's dried up. The, the the idea is 26 gigs and 24 nights and 20 in, in 24 different you know yeah, yeah. the the transient nature of it doesn't uh, absolutely uh, lend itself to people like Lenny White was saying you, you know you'd have people coming and saying you know this was great I'm gonna I'm gonna bring two friends back mm -hmm. tomorrow night if you were two weeks somewhere yeah, you could yeah. really establish the patronage yeah. right yeah. but that's but nowadays you just have one or two nights I just left San Francisco a month ago. Uh, uh, and usually they just have like either at most uh, two nights. But the guy he likes me, a uh, uh, new club. It's, in fact, it's four blocks from where the Black Hawk used to be. It's called the Black Cat now in San Fran downtown. The Black Cat. 
the black cat. But it's in the tenderloin area. I mean, in San Francisco, the contour of the city has changed so much. You have to step over homeless people. And it's right near Union Square. Homeless people just strewn all in the street in Union Square, the shopping center. Uh, it's, no, I was just there. It, it's, it, it was bad 16 years ago. It's an epidemic now. I, I mean, Golden Gate Park, because yeah. I lived there for 30 years of my life. Golden Gate Park, shanty tents and, and, and squatters just throughout Golden Gate Park. It's rampant, overrun with homeless people. The price of living in San Francisco, four to $5,000 a month for a studio. A studio. The gentrification and the pushing out of the yeah, original yeah. people. That's the other thing. You walk through San Francisco, it's all European, young European money. There's no black section of town anymore. Like the Fillmore, where, where the clubs used to be, the after-hour places. Or just all Japanese now, or Chinese. When you, when you, um, so, you know, like, uh, there is no answer, but the questions do matter. I mean, the, the when you, before Black, were you down playing with Groove Holmes in the B3s and the Dawn Sessions? Oh, like, yeah. Can you talk about those Dawn that, Sessions? That, that, just let me backtrack. Just yeah, go ahead, bit. yeah. You, you asked me about, did Miles ever see me, you know, after yeah, I... Yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to... Yeah, let's wrap it up. That. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when I first joined... The first week I was with Herbie Hancock, we were playing opposite Miles Davis in Seattle with the M1D sheet. It wasn't called M1D sheet, just the Herbie Hancock's ex -dead. Were you still playing the Fat Albert Rotunda yeah, thing? Yeah, you hadn't yeah. gone off into your yeah, yeah, new band. Not, not into the M1D sheet yet. And so I, I remember <laughs> I was back. Miles insisted that he would go on first because he, he, he wanted to leave early. <laughs> but I remember I was backstage in this big hall just warming up by myself. And also I just felt this eerie feeling. <laughs> I didn't see, I thought I was by myself. I had to put this creepy feeling. And I turned around, he was this close behind me with his hand on his hip, smiling, and said, Go ahead, Eddie. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep playing, Eddie. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Those dawn sessions, like it was uh, those organ. Tr did the trumpet fit into that? Uh, to that, like. Oh yeah, I, they, they, I remember the, the gigs. Their normal gigs in San Francisco, like if Coltrane or Miles, that would be from like nine until two. Right. Right. The uh, Bob City would open. Uh, uh, it was in the the black section of town from 2 to 6 in the morning, and all the guys like Art Blakey, Freddie Hubbard, Lee Morgan, Miles Coulter, they'd go and, and sit in or not at Bob City from 2 to 6 in the morning. Then 6 in the morning until noon <laughs> would be this, not like Jack's Tavern, a place where Groove Homes and other things. It would be Jack's on Sutter. Well, that Jack's on Sutter, exactly. 6 so, till noon. 6 till noon on the weekends. Wow. Yeah, and, and and when I was in college, I remember I'd be up for the whole weekend, <laughs> just going and listening, or sitting in and listening. You know, did you did you find yourself gravitating to? I guess the better question is the, the did you find yourself gravitating to you know Ornette Coleman uh, in those? Fr fr how did you find your voice? Be Before Ornette got famous, I remember he sat in because I was learning how to play. You know. Let me backtrack a little bit. Yeah. The first time, uh, one of my high school friends, I could play the trumpet, but I didn't know how to improvise. So a friend of mine took me to, to Bop City. And Dewey Redmond, you know, Dewey Redmond, oh, said, he was playing. So when I walked to the door, it was about, like, from <laughs> this door to the bedroom, to the bandstand, mm. you know. And they were playing. It sounded good to me. I just thought it was a hoot nanny. So I pulled out my horn at the door, and said, doo doo. <laughs> What a bad Dewey Redmond, he was up at the band, said, stop, look furious, bad, I mean, the audience turned around and said, what the fuck? You know, Dewey Redmond ran to, to, the, to the door where I was standing and said, little young brother, put your horn back in your case and get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. So, so I said, so you know what I did? I got embarrassed. I started crying. <laughs> And so I said, Dude, well, Dewey, man, the yeah. ear of the beholder, man. Yeah, yeah. So I said, well, you all sounded so good. You know, I just wondered, you know, to play right. with you all. He said, well, we'll go home and practice. I, I had, I'm so naive. I said, practice, practice what? I can play. Right. You know? <laughs> so behind those two notes I played for two and a half years, 
They would not let me. Every time I'd come each weekend, oh, here come this cat. Hi, guys. Can I play? Uh, why don't you wait to come back next week, little young brother? <laughs> you know? And then they found out I was going to medical school, and they told me later, oh, why don't you let young Doc sit in? Maybe after he finishes, he can write us some prescriptions. <laughs> so I just want to clear, you, you at, this was after Howard. This is before Howard. This is before, so the, UC Berkeley. You go, so you were, so you, and you had, so let's talk about the, the, the way you learned, it's very important, improvisation. And most Listen important. Listening to records. <laughs> Listening to Miles Davis records. Was Miles a, a ma I mean, it may be self-evident to us, but was he a master of, of, uh, the trumpet, the, the instrument itself. The begin, a solo that would, would have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. Well, see, everybody talks about Miles Davis as if he came out of a vacuum. <laughs> in Not space. true, yeah. Uh, everybody uh, uh, imitates the people that come before them, who they like, the way they play. Nobody ever talks about Miles Davis is here. Just like I used to copy Miles Davis on his records, Miles Davis' hero was Freddie Webster. You ever hear Freddie Webster? Not many people know because he only recorded eight bars on a record, a uh, Dinah Washington record uh, the tune was If You Could See Me Now. So I remember one time Miles Davis, when, when he heard me play at my parents' house to Sketches of Spain, uh, his record, and I didn't miss a note, and I was proud of myself. I said, well, how did you like that, Miles? He looked at me and said, you sound good, but that's me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and so he walked out. And the next time he came back at my parents' house, he said, Hey, Eddie, you still trying to sound like me? So I said, You mean Freddie Webster? He said, Oh, shit. I didn't know you was hip to that. And then whispered in my ear, He says, I just made a short term loan. <laughs> no, he didn't know. He said, Everybody's a thief. I just made a short term loan. <laughs> You know, everybody's a derivative of their predecessors. Absolutely. You know, so that's how he learned how to play, copying the people that he liked. And then after you, you reach a certain level, you say, wait a minute, who am I? So I used to ask questions, well, uh, what chord is that? And then he'd hear the lick somebody would play. And then I, that's why I asked Miles, I said, well, how do you learn how to play? How do you know what to play? He said, learn as many licks as, you quote, quote, unquote, he said, this, learn as many licks as you can and then scotch tape them together before you know, whoa, I'm playing. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's how those guys learned. In those days, just piecemeal, putting things together. I mean, because music is a language, and in any language, first you got to learn the syllables, how to complete a simple sentence. It's wow. And then a compound sentence, and then, oh, then you're off and running. Then, uh, you know, in conjunction, hooked up to your ears, too. But there's also the, the thing of isolation now. A lot of headphones on, a lot of people yeah. in isolation. It, about So, I mean, going back to improvisation, when Dewey Redmond was like, get your get that shit out of here. Yeah. Uh, how did you, where did you feel like you learned, did you learn with Hadley and Big Black? Is that where you learned improv? Yeah, on the job training. On and, the job training. Is the biggest teacher, I feel. You know, a, a lot of people you see in school with the computer and the headphones on, they're playing by themselves. That's one step. That's the first step, you know. But then the real name of the game is playing with people. You, you can't play music just by yourself. You can, you know, just in a room by yourself. But music is supposed to be played with people, you know. That 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 that's well. And then and then to further that, as Blakey said, it's supposed to wear the wa wash away the dust of everyday life. Absolutely. So it's supposed to have a spirit, a, uh, yeah, collective conscious, step. collective consciousness. Absolutely. But but you have to start somewhere. That's right. You know? But but a lot of people miss uh, the 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 trees for looking at the leaves in the tree. Just play by themselves and they're locked in, and they never go farther than that. They're, come on, you got to get on the bandstand and experience the. Because yeah, uh, mistakes are fine. Because then, then that's the only way, motor of inspiration to learn how to grow. Absolutely. You know. You, I remember you told me that uh, with Black, it was you were playing songs in guitar keys. Yeah, exactly. Explain yeah. why that helped you when you to, to transition into M1 D. The, the guitar key is in the key of E. You know, all, all the open strings. You know, and uh, because he didn't have a piano player, so he had a guitar. We still don't know who that guitar player is. I don't know. We don't that. remember his name. It was myself, Black, Hadley Callinan, 
sickest band and ever. Guitar player. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And no no, no bass, piano. No bass and no piano. And so everything was in the guitar key, was in the obtuse key of E concert, which is F sharp for Hadley and I. And ironically, when I joined M1 D, she, all his tunes were in E. <laughs> and so that was part of my natural vocabulary. That, so Herbert said, wow. <laughs> That was like second nature to me then, you know. Um, in 2018, um, do you feel like, uh, how can musical vocabulary grow mm -hmm. uh, in 2018, being that we've just identified lack of venues, lack of touring circuit, mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases, um, it just sort of, it's very hard to determine who's playing. There's not a yeah. lot of individual sound anymore. Sound, so, sounds almost like, uh, what, what's the word? Um, it's like homogenized kind of sound. Yeah, yeah. Like clones or something. Yeah. Well, they're listening to people and they're yeah. comping people, yeah, but then they don't yeah. go beyond that to yeah. find that, and they don't really have the opportunities to sort of fall on their face and fail. Yeah, yeah. The but, unfortunate thing I see nowadays is, you know, with the hip hop, the advent of hip hop. Sure. And, and kids just trying to play in that genre. You know, I, I find out the way you, a person is, has much more scope and well-rounded when they study the past, where the music came from, which leads, and, and if, if you study history, you can only find out where you are in the present if you know where you came from. So when you study the past, uh, uh, you know, the Dixieland, not that you have to stay there for any length of time, but be aware of the evolution of it up to the present then you can go on to the future and then push the envelope. But when you just start at the top, <laughs> when I say the top, I mean what's happening only in the present time. Absolutely. You're totally limited. Because I just, I just came from Kenny Barron's house and he was talking about, he, when he plays with younger cats, he, uh -huh. someone starts to see, swing and someone says, don't swing, don't swing, that's old, that's old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that. Well, 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 explain, push back old. against that. Why, why is it imperative to swing, uh, and, and and where would you and where would yeah. you where, where do you um, tell your the cats you teach to go to to really yeah. to, to 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 get hip to that stuff? And, okay, yeah. okay, that, 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 that's the answer to that is is, is fully loaded. And then that, so sometimes I tell my students, uh, uh, especially horn players, yeah, because uh, Art Blakey used to do the same thing to me. Now he's a drummer, you know. Like I played with Elvin Jones and Art Blake, the greatest drummers, and Max Roach, the greatest drummers in the world. And whatever you do, if you're a, a horn player, don't try to say, dick, 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 dick. but they'll look at you, sit back and look at you. And Art, one time in the middle of one of my solos, Art stopped playing and screamed on me to the audience, Eddie, look, I have the sticks. I swing you. You don't swing me. <laughs> I felt about this big, and so, so when I hear some of my students yeah. trying to solo, I said, I said, look, oh, I, this sound, I say this with tongue and cheek, don't swing, okay? That's the drummer's job. <laughs> That's the, yeah, then I try to show them, you know, uh, 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 in the context of playing with the rhythm section. The, the rhythm section is there to swing, and, and I'll give you another example. One time I went to hear Miles Davis when he had... Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and Tony Williams. Yeah. My, I'm there with a good trumpet player friend of mine. We're sitting there, and Miles said, Beep! Hit one note, and about 25 seconds elapsed. <laughs> and my Ron just played one note, and, and Miles didn't play another note for about, and Tony Williams and Ron and Herbie was. My friend looked at me after about 20 seconds and said, Miles shook and swing. Oh man! Just play one note. One note. <laughs> so the band swings, <laughs> the rhythm section swings. <laughs> That's what it, it is. The rhythm section. Do you have? Do you have? Do you have like <coughs> all the students that you teach? I mean, are they all brass instruments, or do you have rhythm? Oh, I, I'm like, well, well. Uh, I mean, do you get a chance to work with the percussion department so that you can, yeah. you know, because otherwise those cats are going to keep swinging on the trumpet. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when I was at Juilliard, I taught there for nine years, just trumpet player. At Oberlin, this is my fourth year there. Now, the saxophone players start to come to me. Even the vocal uh, department, the vocalists, 
uh, uh, come to me. Wonderful. You know, and, 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 and so uh, I can talk, talk about things I know as an instrumentalist, convey it to the vocal students, you know. I, even the drummers come to me and want me to be in their ensembles and make comments about uh, 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 functions of rhythm. Bass players start taking lessons from me, too. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, from, it's, from my experience playing with all the, of their heroes, they said, well, Eddie, what do you think? I said, well, first of all, I'll give you one classic example. Uh, younger students, it, it, usually the, the bass is in the middle, piano's over here, and the drummer's over there. So I, I said, well, just play first. And so the bass player, he's looking up like this. The, the drummer, he's looking out the window. And the piano player, he's looking down like this. <laughs> I, I said, first of all, you've gone to concerts where you see, you know, uh, uh, the stage, and they're far away from each other, you know. I said, well, the speed of sound, 720 miles per hour, or whatever it is, there's going to be a discrepancy, so that the, the ideal thing is to get as close together as possible, so there's no discrepancy. Now, the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, so eye contact is ultra important. So if you just look at the body language, because I used to see Billy Hart and Buster Williams, they're standing right next to each, but going out of the way, that ride symbol and the bang right here. So when that hooks up, those two things, the bass and the drums are the focal point of the time. Absolutely. And I used to see Herbie just looking at both of them, and that me, and that's the life support system uh, of of the band, whether it's a big band or a small group. And because if there's a whole discrepancy in that speed of sound, the